What have we been talking about the past couple months? We've been focusing on our three eyes, and who can tell me what those three eyes are? Yes, good job, guys. Intimacy, identity, and influence. Intimacy, who do I belong to? Identity, who am I? Influence, what was I made to do? You don't know what you are made to do unless you know who you are, and you don't know who you are unless you know who you belong to. And through faith in Jesus Christ, we are born again, and the most important thing is obviously, obviously, it all ties back to intimacy, and Jesus came to restore right intimacy, right relationship. And all of this, everything we know about what we were made to do, everything we know about who we really are, it all ties back to the one that we have, that we belong to, the one who made us, the one who made us in his image, and the family that we were born into. So it goes back to our Father God and our spiritual siblings, the family that we have. And it's from them that we start discovering who we are, right? And then, like we talk about this month, we're going to focus on influence. Influence is the capacity of a person to produce effects on the actions, behavior, and or opinions of others. The capacity of a person to produce effects on the actions, behavior, and or opinions of others. Influencers has kind of become a big word in our current culture, hasn't it? Everybody wants to be an influencer. We want to be, and that, what that means to most people now is that you have a YouTube channel. <laughs> it means you have a Twitter account. But what it comes back to is having the capacity to produce effects on others and impact how other people act, impact how other people behave, how other people think, how other people feel about things, right? I like to look at it as the power to be a compelling force. The power to be a compelling force. And all of us innately have a power to be a compelling force. We all have the ability to impact other people, don't we? Even just our attitudes, even just when we walk into a room, if we have a certain emotion, when we walk in, other people feel that emotion, right? The face we carry impacts the people around us. We were all made to have influence as human beings. We are created in the image of God, and we have the power of influence. But one of the things that we also run into is that we are all designed with free will, right? And with free will, we also have the power to decide what that influence looks like. This past week, we've been learning about, in our daily reading, if you, any of you guys are following along with me, we've been learning about three kings, and that's what I want to talk about this week, what I want to talk about today when we're talking about influence. We're going to talk about Jotham. Ahaz and Hezekiah. Those are three kings that all follow, followed each other in the kingdom of Judah. Jotham was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha and the daughter of Zadok. Yeah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father, Uzziah, and... Um, Uzziah had done, except he did not enter the temple of the Lord, but the people still followed corrupt pr practices. Good job. Good job. You did good, Violet. Good job. So Jotham, Jotham's father, it mentions him right here, Uzziah. Uzziah actually did a pretty good job. If you read like the chapter before, it talks about him. And he was a good guy. But you guys remember what happened in the end of his reign? He was a good guy. He did a great job. And then he became proud. And he overstepped boundaries that God had put in his life. And he actually decided he wasn't only the king, he could operate as a priest. And he stepped into the temple and started doing what the priests are only allowed to do. And if you guys remember, in that moment, all the priests were start, started yelling and trying to stop and say, don't do it, don't do it, don't, don't do it. But he proudly wouldn't listen, and he kept going forward, and then he got uh, stricken with leprosy. Boom! His whole body broke out in leprosy, and everyone there saw it happen. So you can imagine what kind of effect this had on his son, right? His son saw 
Uzziah, his, his father, he saw him overstep his boundaries in the temple and suddenly come down with leprosy. And actually, Jotham had to step in and start ruling a little bit early while his dad was still alive because his dad couldn't do anything. If you have leprosy, that's pretty bad. Your body parts start falling off, right? Not a good thing. So Jotham saw all this, and if you saw your father do something like this, if you saw this happen in your dad's life or in someone really close to you, you saw this encounter with a very real God, someone crossing a line and seeing the effects, it would probably affect you, right? You think. I mean, you'd have to be pretty hard-headed if it didn't affect you. Well, for Jotham, what we saw was that it made him more serious, more careful, more reverent. And we see in 2 Chronicles 27, 6, so Jotham became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord his God. And we're going to take this apart real quick. In the Hebrew, became mighty, it means grew firm and strong. The word ordered means established, fixed, framed. The word ways means path, journey. Before, I like this, before actually means face. And then Lord, whenever you see Lord, especially if it's all capitals in the Old Testament, it actually, it's actually Yahweh. It's the name of God. So we can translate this also as saying Jotham grew firm and strong because he fixed his journey facing Yahweh, his God. Jotham, in his influence, in the authority, in the kingdom, in his leadership, it became firm and strong. Why? Because he fixed his journey, his whole life. His whole, your life is a journey, correct? You're always moving somewhere, but he fixed his moving somewhere facing God. He always kept his life facing towards God. You know, Jotham, he kept his eyes. I like this, I like this idea here, this, this word even fixed. He kept his eyes fixed on God. They were locked on. He, he kept God in focus. His whole attention and everything that he had and was, he put it all on God. Now, if you guys paid attention to the previous scripture we saw when Jotham became king. He, uh, he only actually lived to be 41 years old. So how many of you guys are older than 41? You've already outlived King Jotham. <laughs> but Jotham accomplished a lot by the time he was 41 for the kingdom of God. And we have to always keep that in mind. Whatever number of days we have, we have no control over how many days we're going to live in this world. What we do have control over is what we do with the days that we've been given. Each one of us gets to decide what is the legacy that we're going to leave when we move on, right? What are we doing? What are we doing? In Jotham's fairly brief lifespan, he and all that fell within his boundaries, if you read that little chapter of his life, all that fell within his boundaries was blessed secured, and developed. Your life is also a journey. Your life is a journey. From the moment you were conceived, a journey began. And today, the fact that you're here is a journey. Though you begin your journey with the intention of going a certain direction, as distractions come, your face is turned. And you guys know wherever your face is turned, that's where your feet will follow. And that's one of the big truths that we can get out of this right here. He fixed his eyes on God, so his feet continued going in the direction of God. Whatever your eyes are fixed on, your feet will follow. Sometimes we think we're just going to manage to wander through this life and end up in the right place, and that's just not how it works. You end up where your eyes are going. We're not stumbling through this life. We're not, we're, we're not just hoping everything works out. We lock our eyes on our target, and our feet will follow. And that's the journey that we live. What are you looking at? Are your eyes locked on Jesus? Or is the goal of your journey something or someone else, and you're just hoping Jesus will come along for the ride? So I say let's learn from Jotham. Let's learn from Jotham and fix our journey facing God. So this is our first principle of influence right here that we get from King Jotham. Our influence grows firm and strong because we fix our eyes on the Lord. Principle number one, 
Read it with me. Our influence grows firm and strong because we fix our eyes on the Lord. Let's fix our eyes on God and see how he develops your influence. It's not because you followed, followed a well-laid-out plan by somebody on YouTube. All right, so let's, let's look at our second guy here. And this is Ahaz. It's pretty incredible if you guys, when you guys read about the kings. It's just amazing how different each and every one, even coming right after each other, how often they are. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. He did not do what he was ple was pleasing in the sight of the Lord, as his ancestors David had done. Instead, he followed the example of the kings of Israel. He cast metal images for the worship of Baal. Good. Awesome. Thank you. The king that followed Jotham was Ahaz. Ahaz <laughs> chose the complete opposite of his dad, didn't he? And if you read on about him, he's... It's, it's really bad. He went against everything that was God, and he invited in everything that wasn't. And every time he saw somebody else, that, like another kingdom that did something good, he thought, oh, I need that, that guy's God. And so he'd bring in another God. And then even people that conquered him, he would get their God. He never turned to his own, the one true Yahweh, the Almighty, the creator of everything. He never turned to the one who has all power and all authority because he was so busy looking around at what other people had. It's really crazy. When we read the Bible, we see cycles in history of evil influence rising up, right? This happens over and over again. Evil influence rises up, but it only goes so high. And then inevitably, good comes back around. And then we see that over and over again because of the free will that is in this earth. And we have the same free will. And we get to choose, are we going to partner with the good influence and be a good influence, have the good influence of God flowing through us, or are we going to choose the other way? We get to choose because of the free will God's given us. Each generation has the free will to choose how they will influence. Will they take the opportunity to usher in evil? Or repent, throw off the yoke of wickedness, and press into the holy, righteous heart of our good creator, Father God. Do you guys remember the Apostle Paul? Paul was originally, do you remember his first name? Saul. Saul was the leader of the pack when it came to killing Christians. He was fervent. He was excited. He put everything he had into chasing down Christians of women, men. He even talks about, I don't care what gender they are. We'd, I'd grab them and make sure they got punished and killed. He was fully in. But then he had a revelation. He was, he was going the wrong direction, guys. Even though he felt really good about it, he was going the wrong direction. But he had a revelation of Jesus Christ. And that moment, he embraced Jesus and his life changed. And he became exactly what he'd spent all his previous years trying to kill. He repented and changed his life. We don't see Ahaz do that at all. Ahaz never turns, no matter what comes. Even when, the, even when the country that he's in charge of is getting conquered, he still turns to the conquering gods to try to figure out what's going, going on instead of turning back to God. It's crazy. But you and I have the same opportunity. You and I, before Jesus, no matter how good we were, no matter how good our intentions were, we were still going the wrong way. But the moment when we have Jesus revealed to us, we have the opportunity to shift 180 degrees and be part of the good side of the cycle and come back. Thank you, Lord, for that. But have no doubt, God will restore justice and goodness. Like the sun rises in the morning, you can count on it, just like you count on the sun coming up. The godly will celebrate in triumph of good or over evil, and the lovers of God will trample the wickedness of the wicked under their feet. Then everyone will say, there is a God who judges the judges. And there is a great re reward in loving God. Wow. Awesome. Will we participate in, with those 
who say there is a God who judges the judges. There is a God who judges the judges. And there is a great reward in loving God. These are two 100% facts right here, guys. No matter how you try to work it out, there is a God who judges the judges. There is a great reward in loving God. There is, uh, there is a loving God. If I can just get you to take a couple things right here. There is a loving God who judges and rewards. That's what it comes down to. There is a loving God who would love to reward, and he judges. Principle number two from King Ahaz, we will be judged and rewarded by God according to how we choose to influence. You can't pretend your influence doesn't have follow-up. Everything that we do is going to be judged and rewarded. Okay? And that's a wonderful thing. If we're covered by the blood of Jesus, if we're pursuing him, if we're keeping our eyes and our faces fixed on the Lord, man, can't wait to get those rewards. And we have a whole lot of grace to follow our mistakes. If we don't, judgment is coming, okay? King Ahaz had led the nation into the depths of depravity and sin. In rejection of the Lord God, he swung open the city gates, literally, to every enemy intention. He surrendered his influence. The kingdom had fallen so low that it seemed like it would never be restored. Read that chapter. I'm sure people were going, there is no way this kingdom can come back from how low we have gone. They were probably thinking if they had any hope, it's going to take generations to fix this. Because they'd messed up so much. But then Ahaz died. <laughs> like we said, you only have so long to, make, to do good or to do evil, really. Then Ahaz died, and, and if you guys remember, he wasn't buried with the other kings. He was not buried with the other kings. The people that he led into destruction did not find him worthy to bury with his ancestors. He may have lived in the authority of a king, but his influence did not bear the honor of one. And some of us, as believers, we walk in great authority. But if we're not walking with our eyes fixed on the Lord, we're not walking according to the honor of the royalty that we have. So king number three enters the scene. Dun -dun. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah. Abijah? Yeah. <laughs> the daughter of Ze Zechariah. Ze oh, Zechariah. <laughs> and he did not and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. Good job. Thank you, Sean. Was David Hezekiah's father? Nope. But David was the best king that reigned. And so Hezekiah did good enough that he, was, he skipped the previous generations and they equated him to David. That's pretty good. That is pretty good. An interesting thing about these three kings, if you guys have paid, been paying attention, you may have noticed that our first king, it mentions who his mama was. And she was the daughter of Zadok. The second king, it didn't mention his mama. The third king, it mentions his mama again. And something very interesting here, I know historically we just do not know which Zechariah this is. Some people think that it was a king of Israel, Zechariah, but he only reigned for six months before his own people executed him. And I don't think that was who this is because he was a terrible person. <laughs> I think this reference is actually to one of the priests and one of the, one of the guys that worked in the temple, okay? And Zadok was a priest too. And what we see here is that they mentioned the mothers of the priests, and these guys actually turned out pretty good, didn't they? Isn't that interesting? These, these mamas only have their name mentioned like one time in Scripture, but that's one time more than any of us. They had incredible influence. Ahaz's mother, not so much. 
Both Jotham and Hezekiah had mothers who were daughters of priests. Jotham and Hezekiah had fathers that were kings, but their mothers were priests. And they started their reigns by aligning their hearts with the Lord. Their influence was lined up with the Lord. Ahaz, who did not have a priestly mother, immediately aligned her heart, their, his heart, with the sins of Israel. And it's actually written in Scripture. there, Not about his mother, but how he aligned his heart with the sins of Israel. Mothers are powerful influencers, aren't they? Your mama has some influence. And this gives us our next point that we learn from our queen mothers. <laughs> never, never, never underestimate the influence you have on those around you. Never, never, never underestimate the influence you have on those around you. Did I say never? Okay, good. You may not be the king, but your influence, your influence through others will raise up or bring down kingdoms. Never think I'm too small. Never think I have no effect. That's a lie from the, straight from the devil. You are all kingmakers. Every person in this room is a kingmaker in how you influence the people around you. And in how you influence the people around you, you're raising up Jotham's, you're raising up Hezekiah's, or you're raising up Ahaz's. Hezekiah carried the authority of a king and the heart of a priest. At the age of 25, in the first month of his reign, after Ahaz, in the first month of Hezekiah's reign, he changed everything. He put all of his power, all of his energy. He commanded the religious leaders in all the nation to repent, to be purified, and to restore right relationship to the Lord. And it says in 2 Chronicles 29, 36, And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had provided for the people, for the thing came about, say it with me, suddenly. Have you ever rejoiced in God suddenly? Yes, we all know. The Lord can take his time because he made time. And sometimes he's, he's really focused more on our character than the things that we think should happen immediately, right? Sometimes he's building fruit, even though we're more focused on something that we want to happen right now. But he is also the God of suddenly. And he can suddenly do things that nobody else could have done in a lifetime or ever. Suddenly. I love it. He operates in the suddenly as the people unified in repentance, they rejoiced because God had provided, and it happened suddenly. God's provision. God suddenly provided for the people in such a way that they all recognized it, and they all rejoiced. It wasn't like, well, maybe God did something. No, it was like, whoa, God just did something. And all the people were just, whoa. Principle number four. When your influence is rightly aligned with the Lord, an atmosphere is cultivated for the suddenly. I'm going to read that one again. When your influence is rightly aligned with the Lord, an atmosphere is cultivated for the suddenly. No situation is hopeless. When we repent and surrender our lives to the Lord... Entrusting Jesus, entrusting his crucifixion, entrusting his resurrection, entrusting his ascension, and the fact that he is sitting at the right hand of Father God, entrusting his words that say that I have, Jesus Christ said, all authority in heaven and earth. We are suddenly cleansed and forgiven. We are suddenly reborn as co-heirs with Jesus, as sons and daughters of God. We are suddenly authorized as agents of the kingdom of God. We are suddenly the chosen, the elect, and the beloved. We are suddenly seated in the third heaven with our Father God on his holy throne, above all powers, principalities, rulers, and dominions. This right here, all of this happens immediately when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and believe that he died on the cross for you, that he rose from the dead, that he ascended, and he is Lord of your life. All of this happens suddenly. This is a really great thing. Sako and I talk about this last one a lot, especially recently. 
how we sit in the third heaven. And we need to remain there because that's already occurred in how we think and how we process. All that suddenly happens in eternity, all of this that we see here, also reverberates in the natural. What is the thing that is coming about suddenly in your life? What is the thing that God is doing suddenly in your life? Are you aligning your influence with the Lord? When the people turned to God, his provision came quickly, but not everyone was ready, right? And this is something that God's really been speaking to me about this week. Not everybody was ready to participate in what God wanted to do. You guys remember who wasn't? The priests and the mockers. So Hezekiah sent out messages to everybody saying we need to repent. So the couriers went from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Some people are not going to get on board with what God is doing no matter what. Some people just aren't going to do it. And they're going to stand on the outside and point and they're going to laugh and they're going to, they're going to say what they say and they're going to type what they do on Facebook and whatever. Others are just going to be slow to respond. But that doesn't have to be us. That doesn't have to be anybody in this room. We all have the choice. If we're going to be a scorner, if we're going to be somebody who drags our feet, or are we going to be a person that wants to be there right in the front? I had a, I had a vision of a train, roll, and it was rolling into a station. And there were some people who were already ready for the train. They were waiting for it. They were prepared when that train was, it was riding up. And there were other people, after the train pulled out, they're running after it. <laughs> they were doing everything they could in the last minute to try to get on it. And there were the other people that just never showed up at all. Better late than never, but for me personally, I want to be ready when God's movement is coming. When I hear the boop, boop coming out in the distance, when I see the chug, chug smoke popping up of the glory of God and the far out on the horizon, I want to be ready at the train station before he even shows up. I want to be in the beginning of a movement, not one of the people that are going to be running after it to be part of something that God's doing, and definitely not one of the people that sat on the side the whole time and just made fun of what God was doing and missed the entire train. And others are just slow to respond because they're so unfamiliar with God suddenly. So here's what we see as we carry on in the story with Hezekiah. The king, oh, I need another reader. The king, his officials, and all the community of Jerusalem decided to celebrate Passover a month later than usual. They were unable to celebrate it at the prescribed time because not enough priests could be pre- purified by then, and the people had not yet assembled at Jerusalem. So when King Hezekiah called the kingdom of Judah to repentance, it wasn't the religious leaders that led the way, was it? The priests dragged their feet. They procrastinated. They didn't respond initially. They really didn't respond until everybody else was already seeing God do something amazing. They didn't respond until after the rejoicing was already taking place because the suddenly had started. You see later on that they didn't even respond until they were shamed by the people. And so priests were needed, and what happened when you read this story? They had to get the Levites, who were temple workers that were not priests. They were not supposed to be doing priestly duties, but because the priests wouldn't get ready, the Levites, who had, who had been more conscientious, more, more actively concerned about getting ready, they were raised up into priestly positions. They filled the holes. So sometimes we think, well, they can't do that. God is going to slay those people for stepping outside. No, at that time, somebody needed to step up because God was doing something. And the priests weren't the ones that were stepping up to do it. It's pretty wild. So in 2 Chronicles 29, we see that the Levites, those under the priests, had to rise up and take up the slack. And it says, actually, in Scripture, for the Levites had been more conscientious about purifying themselves than the priests had been. Then in 2 Chronicles 30, Passover is postponed. And that's what we're reading right here. Passover is postponed because the priests were slow to purify themselves. And in verse 15, what we would see is that the priests were shamed and finally consecrated themselves. So in this picture, when I was talking about that train, 
the priests are the one chasing after the train trying to jump on at the last minute. Because they see it pulling out and they go, uh-oh. Principle number five. Your influence is constrained by your lifestyle. Preparation and readiness or complacency and procrastination. God is doing something. And our lifestyle is really going to hinder or enhance our ability to get on board with what God is doing. Are we living a life of preparation and readiness? Or are we living a life of complacency and procrastination? It's real easy to think, well, I've got tomorrow to figure this out. Oh, we can worry about this tomorrow. And then miss the whole thing. In Hezekiah's story, he calls the nation to, rep to repentance, but the priests don't act quickly. Revival hits the land, and the priests aren't ready for it. They're the ones that are supposed to be the most ready, and they weren't ready for it. The Levites, non-priests, who served in the temple had to step up and cover priestly duties because the priests were procrastinating and taking their own time. Eventually, when they looked around at what everyone else was experiencing and they realized how their lack of urgency was holding everyone else back, then they felt shame. God didn't wait for them. When this suddenly happens, God isn't going to wait for you either. And he's not going to wait for me. When this suddenly happens... We're ready or we're not. And if we're not and we feel shame, then we can, there's still an opportunity to run like crazy. But I don't want to be the one running after the train. I want to be the one that's already sitting on the train. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit is saying now. I put that in my weekly email on Wednesday. The Holy Spirit is saying now. As a church, we are a holy kingdom of priests. If you've received Jesus Christ, you are a priest. And God is saying, now. Get ready now. Stop dragging your feet. Stop procrastinating. You are a priest. Get ready now. Not tomorrow. Right now. Get ready. We've been hearing over and over again, and I've talked about it over and over again, that we really are just in the beginning of what is going to be the greatest awakening. God is doing something incredible, and you can feel it in the air. And it's about to be an opportunity that we're going to be chasing after. Because now is the time to get serious. Do you guys feel it? Do you guys feel it when you're hanging out with God? Do you feel it? There's no more time to put off what the Lord has been telling you to do. There's no more. There's no more time to put it off. There's not another day. There's not another week. There is no more time to procrastinate. There's no such thing as spiritual retirement. There's no longer grace for spiritual meandering and taking your own sweet time. If you want to fully participate in what God is doing, we need to repent and humble ourselves now. And we got to take it seriously. We have to immediately get back into a place of active listening obedience. Active listening obedience right now. Open our ears now. Open our eyes now. Open our hearts now. Now is the time to get ready and get active. The greatest awakening is here, and King Jesus is like Hezekiah, calling out, saying, now is the time. Come to the Lord. Repent and prepare yourselves, people. Repent and prepare yourself. I just don't want to be on the tail end of what he's doing. Everything in me wants to be right there in the beginning of it. Now's the time. Now is the time. And this is still from our Second Chronicles 30, right? It says, For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. This takes us in a full circle back to what we started talking about. Locking your eyes on Jesus. Locking your eyes on the Lord. Fixing your face on God. But the benefit of us fixing our face on God is that he fixes his face on us. Why? Because he's gracious and merciful. But sometimes we just want to ride on the gracious and merciful and never turn our faces towards him. But it, say, it doesn't say that. It says he's gracious and merciful. Return to him.
Let's humble ourselves together. Let's direct all of our glory and praise. Let's direct all of our attention. Let's lay all of our lives. Let's put everything that we are down at his feet. Everything. Let's not wait for tomorrow. Let's do it today. Let's make him number one today. Let's give him every bit of glory today. Let's turn all of our attention back to him today and lock our eyes on him and say, Lord, help me to lock my eyes on yours. And he says, I've got you, son. I've got you, daughter. My eyes are locked on your eyes. Just keep looking back. Keep looking back. Turn to me. I am gracious. I will carry you through this. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. So these are our principles of influence. Our influence grows firm and strong because we fix our eyes on the Lord. Number two, we will be judged and rewarded by God according to how we choose to influence. Number three, never, never, never underestimate the influence you have on those around you. Number four, when your influence is rightly aligned with the Lord, an atmosphere is cultivated for the suddenly. Number five, your influence is directly related to your lifestyle, preparation, and readiness or complacency and procrastination. So next week, we're going to break into lab groups, and I want you to come prepared with these questions here for lab groups on August 8th. Briefly share about one person who dramatically influenced your life in a positive way. Number two, how do you fix your eyes on the Lord? Number three, do you have a testimony about God suddenly? Or do you need a testimony about God suddenly? Number four, How are you purifying and positioning your life in preparation for what God is doing? Because God is doing something. And the first step is just putting your faith in that. If you start wrapping your faith around the fact that God is doing something, then you you can't help but decide, am I going to be on board or not? I feel like the Spirit is saying, don't wait for your Christian leaders and celebrities to lead you into revival. Don't wait for your priests and pastors to pursue purity. I'm calling all women, men, adults, and children to myself. Regardless of everyone around you, including your leaders, seek me. This next great kingdom movement is not because of a person on a platform. It's because I'm meeting with my children on their knees in their bedrooms, in the quiet of their cars, with their heads bowed at their schools and workplaces, with their hands lifted in worship, I'm working restoration in the sincerity of the quiet place. The groans of penitent hearts will become a roar of praise. Come. Right now. Come. As we already saw, the Lord your God is gracious. The Lord your God is merciful and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Come now. Come now. 100% with everything that you are. Put it all before the Lord. While we're worshiping today, put everything that you are before God. So everyone right now, get somewhere where you, if, if you need to get, if you are comfortable sitting, if you're comfortable standing, wherever you need to be to put all of your attention right now on the Lord. That's what we need to do right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We are your people. We are your people, God. We love you. We surrender all that we are to you, and we declare you are Lord of our lives. We just want to be involved in everything that you're doing. We want to partner with you as your children. Thank you, Father, for your gracious, loving kindness. Right now, we repent of everything else that we've chased. We repent and turn away from everything else that we've had our faces turned towards. We repent from the direction that our feet were taking because of our eyes. And we turn back to you, Father God. We return to you, Father. And we fix our faces on your face. And we all pray, Lord, help us. Help us, Holy Spirit. You are our helper, Holy Spirit. 
Help us to keep our eyes locked on our Father. We love you, God.